Welcome to the Zen of Refing Roller Derby, Lesson 22A, Game Structure Penalties Part 2, Part 1. It is Part 1 of Part 2, if that makes any sense. I'm Axis Estevel, the author of the training manual. I'm filming this on June 13th, 2018. The content of this presentation is up to date as of this recording. Uh, should this video become outdated or replaced by a newer version, I'll put a link on the screen to where you can find more information. And as always, you can find the latest version of the full training manual at www.tinyearl.com slash zenreffing. A quick disclaimer, the WFTDA, MRDA, and JRDA are not responsible for the content of the training manual or this presentation, nor do they make any claims as to the accuracy of their content. Another note, if you spot any errors or outdated information on, in this presentation, please put a comment on YouTube explaining the issue and listing the timecode. Now, Lesson 22 is on Game Structure Penalties Part 2, basically gaining position, better known as cutting the track, and on altering the flow of the game. There's a lot I want to cover, so I'm splitting this into two lessons. 22A will be on cutting the track, 22B on altering the flow of the game. I'm back here on Erdum because I'm going to talk about gaining the position, which is better known as cutting the track. And then in a few moments, I will be back outside. Uh, well, in a few minutes, I will be outside of Erdem again, and I'm going to talk about altering the flow of the game. All right, let's talk, start by talking about gaining position. What is gaining position? It is the illegal use of the out-of-bounds area to gain position on another skater. So this is the classic example right here. Okay. Purple three, blah. Okay, we got purple three blocks one out-of-bounds. One goes out of bounds, and they come in in front of purple one. They have illegally gained position. I can even simplify it, by the way. I just purple three blocks yellow one out of bounds. Excuse me, blocks yellow one out of bounds. Yellow one comes back in in front of purple three. They have gained position on purple three. That is a penalty. Now, let me go back and let me explain some concepts here because. This is going to start simple, but it's going to get very complex today. All right, number one, gains of positions are always measured at the hips. Remember, we talk about whether skaters are in and out of bounds by looking at the skates. We talk about the direction they're moving by looking at the skates. But if we want to know who's ahead of who, we always look at the hips. It's that way for scoring. It's that way for gaining position in terms of cutting. Because really, gaining position for scoring, gaining position for purposes of cut, it's all the same thing. All right, next, a downed skater who re-enters the track does not gain position until they are upright. So, case in point, okay, don't worry, don't worry, you know, you know just skip the engagement, don't, don't mind the engagement zone for a minute, just ignore that. Let's say purple three comes in and blocks yellow one, right there, and yellow one falls down, so yellow one is down, and they're sliding, and they come right back in here, and they're still down. This is not a cut. The reason being is because yellow one is still down. They have not returned to an upright position and therefore have not assumed a position on the track. Basically, if you're down, you're not considered to have a position on the track. So we don't, you know, like you haven't owned it. So, you know, yellow one could crawl back off or yellow one could stand up and then exit the track. Now, something too, we don't issue cut penalties instantly. They do have a chance to seed. We'll talk more about that in a minute to avoid the penalty. So if yellow one comes sliding back in, well down, they're down. Now yellow one stands up. Yellow one, you know, even, even the moment they stand up, they have now gained position. You know, they have now cut the track. They must, they can immediately skate back out of bounds to avoid that. Or if they were still down, they could have crawled off. Either works, but they, they're going to have to give up that advantage because they have illegally gained an advantage on another player. This is basically rules way of saying, no, you can't just like cut across the out of bounds and kind of go anywhere you want to like that. If you're, if you're gaining position on another, on another skater, then you're engaging in an illegal act. Let's keep going on with concepts here. Skaters have no position if they are down or out of bounds. That's what I just talked about. If they were down, that didn't count. They slid on the track. But even if a skater is down, let's say, uh, let's say, three has a you know is sprinting has a very violent sneeze and goes off the track and falls down and slides back in but yellow one is also down yellow one is down this whole time i don't know maybe they're retying their shoelace or something 
and then Purple 3 stands back up, Purple 3 has not cut the track. They do, or rather, they did not gain position on any skaters because Yellow 1 is down and has no position to gain. Similarly, suppose Yellow 1 was out of bounds. Purple 3 goes by. Purple 3 has not gained position on Yellow 1 because they're out of bounds, and that's to the in or the outside. It doesn't make any difference. If you're down or out of bounds, you don't have a position on the track that can be cut. Similarly, uh, blockers outside the engagement zone do not have a position that can be cut. So if, oh, I don't know, Purple Jammer over here gets blocked out of bounds, boom, Purple Jammer goes out and comes back in, this is not a cut. Why? Because, they're cut, because they are gaining position on a skater who's on a blocker, I'm sorry, who's outside the engagement zone. Blockers have no position if they're outside the engagement zone. They only count for purposes of gaining position if they're inside. So, and that's basically to encourage them to get back inside. So if they leave the engagement zone, they lose their perks because they're not supposed to be there. Their position doesn't count anymore. Now, mind you, that doesn't mean that, you know, Purple Jammer would be getting a point for purposes of scoring or something, you know, but that's a whole different conversation, and we talked about that in the advanced scoring lesson. Now, another concept. No pack situations do not exempt skaters from illegal gains of position. So, let's say we got a no pack here. And Purple Jammer gets blocked out and comes back in front of them. Okay, even though, yes, in some ways there's technically out of play because they were in a no pack situation, that's that's not what we're talking about generally with out of play. Out of play, we're generally talking about outside the engagement zone. And in this particular case, there's no pack, and so while there is no engagement zone, it's still a cut. Just because there's no pack does not exempt Purple Jammer that they can cut the track and that they can gain position on people. So during a no pack situation, no, they have to pass people by staying on the track and pass them as normal. They cannot go out of bounds to do it. There is an exception here. Skaters more than 20 feet from the nearest, uh, from the, the nearest last defined pack have no position. So let's say, oh, yeah, let's see, ah, here we go. Let's say yellow three is up here. And, you know, right now, uh, here we go. Yellow jammer knocks purple out. Purple's really flying. They go, woo! they come right back in here that is not a cut okay now mind you there's no engagement zone so it's not like yellow three is out of play but because they're more than 20 feet from the from the uh you know from the last known last defined pack we're just basically going to say yeah they're, they're, they don't count you know like we will make them not gain position on people during a no pack situation to some point but at some point they they're just too far out we're just not we're not going to care we don't care anymore like it's it's not a it's, you know, they need to get back and at least be near where the reformation is going to take place in order for them to count. So that's pretty rare, by the way, and mostly will happen if there's like, oh, I don't know, yellow three just returned from the penalty box or something like that. And then this person gets boo knocked like that and they gain position there. So, again, we're, we're not counting that because they're just too far out. So generally speaking, you will know when people are like this because they're going to be very far away. It's very rare you get someone who's like exactly 21 feet and you need to be measuring what's going on. Now, we talked a little bit about illegal gains of position can be seeded. And let me talk about seeding now. Um, first, this is what seeding is. It is seeding is, let's say, uh, pivot gets knocked out of bounds. Pivot comes back in front of yellow three. Pivot has now cut the track. In the olden days, it would instantly take in the penalty. The moment that they came, they reestablished their inbounds position, boom, that was the penalty. Well, <laughs> skaters accrued a lot of cuts that way. So one of the ways that the rules have been kind of cutting down on this is by saying, you know what? You did gain an advantage, but we're going to give you a chance to yield that advantage. Now, there's no warning given. This is the, totally up to the skater that they need to know when they've done this. And sometimes they know it, and sometimes they don't. But often they do. And that skater must immediately fully exit the track. By fully, this is not sufficient. Touching here is not sufficient. You know, actually the line's in bounds. They're in bounds. A little bit off. Not sufficient. Not sufficient. Not sufficient. Even touching the line, but otherwise being out of bounds is not sufficient. Get off the track totally. That is fully. 
and the skater must immediately do it. Immediately means at the first legal opportunity. Now, if the skater comes back in and they're like wildly skating on one foot and they're not in control, then we understand that you cannot cede if you're not in control of your actions. You know, but once that skater you know regains their balance and they regain control, then they must immediately cede. If they're moving at very high speed, it might take them a moment to do it. But again, that's that's more of an issue of control. <coughs> What you would be looking for would be the skater who's in control but does something else, like they continue to stride forward, or they change position and start going this way, or they initiate a block, or they start assisting a teammate, or something that is not seeding the track. Now at some point, you can use a little judgment. Let's say the skater comes back in and, you know, let's, let's just, it doesn't matter how they got there. Let's just say purple pivot is down. And pivot, pivot, pivot has cut, okay? Like they they came in while they were standing up, so they've regained position, but then they tripped and fell over. So at this point, purple pivot needs to immediately exit the track. The fact that they're down doesn't exempt them from this. They can't just sit there in a down position because they already cut when they first came back in and were standing. So that means as soon as they regain control of themselves, like you know, after they finish falling and kind of start picking themselves back up, they need to exit the track. If they crawl, fine. If they stand up and skate, fine. If they go this way, fine. I just want to see them immediately exiting the track. Now, I would not like it if the person barely came on and was like this, and their idea of immediately seating was to go to the outside because they can exit very quickly like this. If they're in the middle, I don't care. I actually had a case today where a skater something happened she she was going very fast she got blocked out of bounds she turned she came back in and just she was a little off balance and she just went whoop, completely like that and went off the track to the far side and thought about it for a second I was like okay i'll take that as seating you know that wasn't the person deliberately trying to gain some sort of advantage they just that was just the way their momentum took them and okay but yeah uh you know again if they crawl two steps then stand up then skate fine you know i just you know show me that they are making a good faith effort to seed their position. Now, what I would not want to see would be the skater crawl two steps, then stand up, then skate, then stop, and look around, and then, like, look at me, like, you know, like, shrugging the shoulders, do I have to seed? You know, like, no, that's that's not that's not seeding. That's basically the skater getting confused and kind of standing there. So, but yeah, show me a good faith effort that they're exiting the track. Um, if a skater is prevented from exiting, let's say there's a line of blockers, okay, Purple pivot has cut. They need to seed, but they can't. These blockers are in the way. Well, I'm not going to penalize them because they have to immediately exit the traffic, immediately being at the first legal opportunity. But if they're being prevented from exiting, they don't have the opportunity. So I'm not going to penalize them. And if they want to skate forward and around, fine. Back and around, fine. You know, because they're doing, they're making a good faith effort to go. So as long as they keep trying to get out, then I'm fine. I wouldn't even have too much of a problem if they were kind of like jostling and trying to get through. I wouldn't want them to be like engaging in playing derby for like another advantage. But yeah, if they had to kind of bump their way through, I'm fine because these people are like, basically since, oops, my pack went there. Since they're not letting Purple Pivot uh, exit, then Purple Pivot, you know, uh, it's, it's, I'm sorry, since Purple Pivot can't seed, they can continue playing derby until they can. And if that means blocking yellow two out of bounds so they can get out, I'm totally fine with that. You know, again, as long as the action they are taking is helping them seed. If Purple Pivot was just absolutely just shut down and they're going back and forth and back and forth and these three blockers are just, they're always staying in the way and Purple Pivot just cannot get there and finally Purple Pivot just, just stops and just shrugs their shoulder and just stands there. I'm not going to penalize them for that either. They've made a good faith effort and they're frustrated that they can't get out, you know. I'm fine with that. But yes, as soon as they have space, then Purple Pivot needs to seed by exiting totally. Something about jam call-offs too, by the way. Sometimes it happens that you've got a jammer comes back in. Now this jammer here has to seed. And the jammer, instead of seeding, regains control, stops, then starts calling off the jam. I'm going to issue a penalty for that. I'm not going to call off the jam. The reason being is Purple, or purple Jammer... Uh, like, Purple Jammer, instead of seeding, elected to call the jam. That means that they take that penalty 
before the jam call off really would take effect, you know, like or before I would respond to their signal. If they were coming back in and they're already calling it off, calling it off, calling it off, and those whistles are blowing and then they just stand there, I'm fine with that because the jam, you know, just like we'll let a skater exit the track during the jam call off whistles. If they if the whistles already blowing and they just want to stand there, I'm fine with that too. So what exactly is the impact to call a penalty on a skater uh, for gaining position? The impact is there are two possible impacts. One, <coughs> a skater returns in front of one or more opponents. Jammers, blockers, whatever, one or more. Or two, oops, here we go, move this up here. Or two or more teammates. That would also be a cut. And by the way, that's an excellent use for a three-star cue there, if you're looking for something, to basically say, like, um, you know, purple, two, seven, cut, two teammates. Because they might be thinking, but there were no opponents there. How did I cut? And then you go, oh, two teammates. Oh, yes, that makes sense. Like that. We will give them one teammate for free. Now, if they were to do that during their initial pass, like towards lead jammer, we will not consider that earning a pass on that blocker, by the way. So, uh, But generally speaking, yes, we will give them one for free. Matter of fact, always we'll give them one for free, just because we're going to assume that one was not enough to warrant. Uh, you know, it just <clears throat> it wasn't enough impact on the game going past one teammate, two teammates. Yeah, now they're pushing it. And by the way, you will see rare cases on occasion when you get something like this, and the skater gets blocked out of bounds and manages to come back in front of the entire pack. They get all eight skaters. It is rare. And actually, referees have been known to flinch and blink and not call it because they're just so stunned. They're like, the skater can't possibly be have done that intentionally. Like, like I must have clearly seen something wrong because they, they can't possibly have been that stupid. Uh, yeah, actually, sometimes they are. You know, So it, it does happen. It's rare, but it does happen. All right. Now let's talk about what the gaining position penalties and verbal cues are in a little more detail on this. Okay, as I said, cut. That's the basic verbal cue. So anything we're going to talk about now in the way of gaining position, you can call as the penalty cut. And by the way, bonus points if you hold it up high over your head so the penalty trackers can get it. Cut refers to a skater returning from out of bounds. And by the way, that does include a straddling position. So if this skate straddles, and wait, I'll even make it the jammer straddles and goes past everybody and comes back in. They just cut the entire pack. They have to seed. Um, it does not include, uh, when we say cut, a skater returning from the penalty box or returning from the bench area, you know, because they went over there to deal with some equipment failure or they, you know, they were basically withdrawn from the jam or a skater who temporarily withdrew for injury. You know, they were like, not just standing like right here just barely out of bounds but they had clearly like gone off for a while and they're like Ugh, you know they're gone for a while and then they come back you know so cut only generally refers to just from out of bounds like the skater that just went off to tie their shoe the skater that was just momentarily winded that needed a few moments to recover and then they're back back um when they come back in all upright inbound skaters ahead of the skater who went out of bounds have superior position. So let me explain. Let's say, oops, I don't want a no pack. Okay. Let's say yellow jammer here gets blocked out of bounds. It doesn't matter about you. They get blocked out of bounds. And they come back in here. They have now cut four skaters. Obviously that would be a cut. Now they have to seed. But let's say they come in here, oops, wait, that's a teammate. Let me make that an opponent. And there, I'm going to set this here as well. Okay, so they get blocked out of bounds here. And meanwhile, purple three goes down. They come back in front of purple three. Purple three is down. They have no position on the track. Remember what I said? The out of bounds and down skaters don't matter. We only care about the upright inbound skaters. What you need to do is when, bring that person back up, when Yellow Jammer goes out of bounds, as a referee, you're taking a mental picture instantly of who is ahead of that, uh, of that, uh, excuse me, who is ahead of that jammer that is both upright and inbounds. Because you see, 
when they come back in, they cannot be improving their position. So let's say purple three was down when they went out of bounds. Even if purple three gets up and they come back in, did they really better their position? No, because purple three had no position when they went out. So they didn't better their position. Like purple three has gained a position. So did yellow jammer, but we're not gonna say one's better than the other. But if purple three, you know, uh, went out and then came back in while they're upright, well then yes, obviously that certainly is. Um, it works also, you know, same thing for inbounds, obviously. You know, yellow jammer goes out, purple three enters, yellow jammer comes back in. There's no penalty. Purple three did not have a position. You're essentially comparing the photographs. Remember I said, take a mental photograph. Imagine if this was the mental photograph. Well, what you're going to see is there are two skaters on the track with superior position. This one comes in and then Yellow Jammer comes in. And look, there are still those same two skaters with superior position. So no problem like that. The fact that they've gained on three doesn't matter because we're only looking at the ones ahead. By definition, you cannot cut someone that was behind you when you went out of bounds. You cannot cut somebody that was down when you go out of bounds. You cannot cut somebody who is out of bounds or out of play when you go out of bounds. We're only looking at those skaters to see if this person comes back and they've improved their position because we're like, wait a second, yellow one was ahead when they went out of bounds, yellow one is behind now. That's a problem because that's the cut. They gained a position on yellow one. Actually, that wouldn't because yellow, yellow was a teammate. So let me switch those two. There we go. So we'd say, look, they returned in front of purple two. That would be the cut. Superior position is temporarily lost if the skater goes down, out of bounds, or out of play, but can be gained by reversing this. All right, let me explain what I mean. First, I'm talking about these skaters, not the jammer. So let's say yellow jammer goes out of bounds. We're going to take like a little snapshot. Look, we got purple one and purple two ahead. Now, purple one goes out of play, comes back in goes out of bounds, comes back in, falls down, gets back up. Now, they if, if yellow uh, jammer comes in, then it's like they, ha they still have to have, like, it doesn't matter the fact that purple one did all that, yellow jammer still has to return in back of both of those skaters because we are comparing essentially pictures, like, Let's say we got a before picture with those two ahead. We got an after picture with those two ahead. That's fine. Now, consider this. Yellow jammer goes out. Purple one, da, 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 down, up. Yellow jammer returns in front of purple one. And we're going to compare pictures. The before picture, purple one was ahead. The after picture, purple one is behind. That's a cut. We're only comparing the pictures. What happened during that time didn't matter. So like I said, if purple one, you know, if they temporarily go down, you know, whoops, uh, yeah. So if purple one temporarily goes down, then yellow can return in front of them. But if purple uh, one goes down then up, when yellow jammer comes back, that's a cut because they have regained their position. They can only temporarily lose the superior position. They regain it by returning to their natural stat state of being upright inbounds in the engagement zone. Now, this is not true for the initiator of a block. So let's say in this case, that purple one blocked yellow jammer out. Now notice in this case, I've got purple one even behind yellow jammer. See, purple one has just Oops, there we go. Purple one has stayed in, but yellow jammer went out. In this particular case, um, purple one has, oops, there we go. Okay. In this particular case, purple one is going to get a perk because they initiated the block that forced yellow jammer out of bounds. So we're going to give them a special reward for doing a good job at knocking that jammer out. That reward is they gain superior position over yellow jammer. This, by the way, is true. Even though purple one was behind yellow jammer, it doesn't matter. So purple one automatically gets superior position because they blocked yellow jammer out because purple one was the initiator of the block. You're only going to generally have one 
initiator. 99.9999% of the time, you only get up one initiator. I suppose you could make some bizarre scenario in which there were two people equally pushing somebody out. Generally speaking, it doesn't really work that way. You're going to have one initiator. So purple one is the initiator. So they get superior position. Congratulations. You get this perk. But that perk comes with a price. And the price is this. We're no longer comparing you in photos. So instead of photos, like, again, we're looking at the before and after photo on purple too. See if they are ahead of you. But now, instead of a photo, we're going to point a video camera at purple one. And as soon as purple one goes out of bounds, they've lost that superior position. They cannot retrieve it. It's gone. We watched it on the video. We saw it when it occurred. Same thing. If purple one went out of play, purple one fell down. They lose that. It doesn't matter if purple one goes out then back in. They've lost their superior position, and Yellow Jammer can now enter legally. It's a nowhere in pass for them, or, uh, for them, for Yellow Jammer re-entering, but it's not a penalty. So, again, non-initiators, which is going to be most skaters on the track, it's a before and after photo we're comparing. For the initiator, it's like having a video camera on them, and we're going to uphold them to that high standard because that's the price they pay for that privilege of getting superior position, even if they happen to be behind them at the time. And by the way, even if they, if, if Yellow or Purple One had been ahead of Yellow Jammer and manages to force Yellow Jammer out, it doesn't matter. Purple One still, ha you know, still has to uh, have that video camera staring at them, and they have to uh, stay upright, inbounds, and in play. So you will see sometimes, by the way, the skater gets knocked out of bounds. And the jammer doesn't come back in, you know, because the jammer, you know, maybe purple one starts skating clockwise because they want to draw the cut and purple one goes back to here. And yellow jammer really doesn't want to have to go in back of them and enter the back of the pack. So yellow jammer just stands there and yells at their team, knock her down. And so somebody goes over there and knocks her down or knocks her out of bound. And then the jammer can enter like that. It's very efficient if they do. I've also seen games where the jammer's yell standing there yelling, you know, knock her down, knock her out, you know. And nobody on the team seems to hear or respond. And after about five seconds, the jammer goes, you know, and comes back here and enters there. So that happens too. Finally, let's say it, take an apex jump. Uh, let's let me move them back here. There we go. Okay. Purple jammer is coming in for the apex jump. If purple jammer lands straddling, they look boom, boom. There, they just land right here. Purple Janner cannot enter. If they do, that's a cut. So even though there was no physical block that kind of put them outside, you think of this in terms of it was sort of a positional block that they were sort of responding to. Normally for cuts, we're not really dealing with positional blocks. But in this particular case, for an apex jump, we will. Now, something to kind of keep in mind is we talked about during scoring that if they're right foot in this particular case, I'm going to assume they're facing forward. So their right foot lands inbounds first, and in that instant they get points. But then the left foot, uh, the left skate lands out of bounds. So now they're straddling. Well, remember, when a jammer is landing, they have not fully gained control of themselves yet. You know, it takes a moment there to land and kind of get their balance. So the aftermath of a block is not complete, until a skater has regained control of their actions. And obviously when they're landing, they're not in control. They're still kind of landing. So this was a positional block. They get the points, but by the time they, they land and get, regain control of themselves, they are straddling. So we require, you know, uh, in this case, you know, we require that they go back out of bounds. If Purple Jammer enters, they're cutting, and they must come back out of bounds anyway. So again, that only matters if they land in, in, then out, you know, or, or out, then in. That would be the same thing. They land straddling. It also will affect if they take off from a straddling position, you know, uh, because, again, if they leave from a straddling position, even if they land inbounds, they cut because these were not legal. They did not legally gain position. They used that out-of-bounds area to gain position. So, again, all skaters pass during an apex jump that lands in a straddling position, they retain their superior position. These still have their superior position, even if points were scored on them in the process. Now I want to talk a little bit, and it won't take very long, talk about illegal reentry. Illegal reentry is the other verbal cue. Think of this as a two-star cue, a medium cue. 
and this refers to a skater returning from the penalty box, temporary withdrawal from the jam due equipment, failure, injury, whatever, you know, like this. So let's just say yellow jammers in the box. And I'm going to kind of mix up the pack a little here, just make it interesting. All right. There we go. And I'm probably going to move one of these people back here. Here we go. Oops. No, oh, there we go. Okay. When Yellow Jammer comes back, all in play blockers, that's everybody here except the Jammer. Everybody here, all in play blockers that are upright. In, remember, in play means also means upright and uh, in bounds. All those in play blockers, so not including the Jammer, have superior position. So the Yellow Jammer must return behind them. They can return. Yellow Jammer can return in the engagement zone, but they must return behind everybody. If Yellow Jammer was to return here, we would allow it simply because, remember what we said before, we will let them uh, you know, enter ahead of one teammate. But if we reverse these, and Yellow Jammer enters here, they have illegally re-entered, and they must immediately cede that position and then re-enter legally. But they must immediately cede the position if they wish to avoid getting an illegal re-entry penalty. Um, yeah, oh, one more thing to keep in mind here. Jammers do not have superior position. Like I said, that only refers to blockers in this case. So again, if yellow comes back and they enter in front of purple jammer, that's fine, because... <laughs> We're basically we're trying to require that they they re return at the back of the engagement zone, return behind the pack, return behind all those in play skaters. But remember, the jammers are never part of the pack. Jammers are sitting there and they're zooming around during the jam, so we're not going to really worry about where the other jammer is. They just need to get back, you know, back in behind all the blockers and begin their trip through the pack again. So now one more thing I want to point out: it uh, there are let's say yellow jammer gets blocked out of bounds here. Yellow Jammer comes in, and they seed. And they come in, and they seed. And in, and seed, and in, and seed, and in, and seed. And they're going in and out. Are we going to issue a penalty for that? No. As long as they're immediately seeding each time. Basically, every time they seed their cut, then they have a fresh, clean slate. If they re-enter, now they need to immediately seed. Re-enter, need to immediately seed. A fresh, you know, a fresh, uh, you know, a uh, fresh sheet every time. You know, we're we're not judging them on what they did before. Now it's stupid for them to do so. They're probably going to piss off their team in the audience. That's not our concern. In, out, in, out, fine. You're more likely to find that as they're going back to the back of the pack. You know, somebody's trying to draw the cut, and they're going back, and they jump in, and they realize, oh, I didn't make it, and then they got to go back out, and they might try to jump in again, but the person's still behind, and they go back out. You know. So you're more likely to see it more like this, you know, before they finally enter legally behind everybody. So, And that is what I've got on cuts now. So there's, you know, obviously quite a bit to this. So, uh, And I'm going to dig up some footage over here. Cuts are easy to get footage of, so I'm going to show you some good stuff. All right, back at my messy desktop, let's take a look at some footage. All right, first up... Keep an eye on the jammer right here in back, trying to go around, and see what happens. 3-1. Jammer's going back. Jammer comes back. Blue! And I promptly issue a cut on blue, too. Let's see if this was a good call. All right. Jammer's coming up behind three black blockers. The blocker with the red helmet has initiated... Over there, she's kind of bumped into her. And there she goes again. And a little hard to tell right now. This is not a good view for me. Like, you know, is she inbounds or is she out of bounds? I have no clue from my angle. But what we can kind of see here is she's... There we go. Like, the pivot at some point here is going in, you know, in for a block and has blocked her out of bounds. But one thing here, she's now ahead of the other two blockers. So if the pivot is the initiator that's finally blocking her out of bounds, it's those two. If, if if she's already out of bounds and we really can't tell this very well, then it's that blocker probably with the red helmet. You know, Again, I need an OPR to make a judge on this. So, she's blocked out of bounds. The initiator goes out of bounds, so now she can't be cutting that. So if she entered right here, perhaps she'd be legal. She went back. I don't know exactly what happened that launched her on the floor, but either way, that same team, so it's, there's no clockwise block penalty probably there. And she comes back 
the jammer comes back in front of this one with the blue helmet. I issued a cut at this. Retrospect? Probably wrong, because again, as near as I can tell, she's blocked out of bounds by the pivot. She's already ahead, so it would not be a cut on there. What I want to do is show this. Now, suppose I'm refing this. I want you to look up at where the OPR is on this. 3-1. Okay, we've got an OPR right there in front. Where are my OPRs? Where's an OPR here? Where are my OPRs? Blue! See what happened is I had to make a judgment for myself. Now it does look like this game, and I and I don't I didn't I've only got this little clip of footage here. It does look like this game might only have two OPRs. So right off the bat, yes, if, if you only have two OPRs, things are gonna get missed. But here, and again, I don't want to fault these particular OPRs. I know I know everyone tries to do their, their best, but at some point I made a judgment on here that I got wrong. Now we've got a front OPR watching this. So the front OPR ought to have a pretty good idea who the initiator was, who blocked them out of bounds, but the front OPR isn't following back. So we get back here, she re-enters. Now we got a rear OPR there on the outside who presumably had no idea what happened in front and has no idea if this is a good call or not. And now I'm forced to make a judgment because I have no one giving me a signal from the outside. Remember, we talked about that we want, or that OPRs are the rear view mirror for the jammer referees. This is exactly the sort of scenario. What we ideally want to see is, and this is what I teach people basically, is that we want to see an, a, an OPR basically right on the outside, you know, beyond so you can tra track from jammer referee to jammer to an OPR. With two, it's a bit harder to do that because they have to play triage. But again, I in this case, that front OPR should absolutely be moving back because she can track, she knows what's cutting and what's not far better than I do. And again, at some point, you know, that blue jammer is going to re-enter back here. I can't see exactly where she's re-entering. I guess right, right about there. So she's re-entering, and I have no OPR on the outside that can make this call as to what's going on. So, uh, you know, moral on this story over here is that these mistakes are going to be much higher if the, the jammer referees have to be judging what's going on at the outside line. Remember what we talked about with high blocks. Ideally, what we want is we want OPRs watching the line on the outside. So like right now, for example, as she's going in, we want the jammer referees looking up for a potential high block and let that OPR look down there at the line. But in trusting the OPRs to get that action, the OPRs have to follow up and have to run back with that jammer so that they can make that call You know, when she re-enters. In this case, I didn't have that support. I made my best judgment, I miscalled it, and a bad penalty got called as a result. All right, let's take a look at the next next one up here. And here we go. All right, what we've got here, and again, I'll play this real quick. Let's look for a potential cut, maybe on the part of that front person. She's gone out of bounds, blocker's going back. Blocker gets blocked right to the line. She re-enters and back. So there's no, there's no cut in this. And this is a this is a perfectly good no call because again we've got the the jammer's gone out of bounds. That is that the blocker with the blue helmet. Oh, that's a pivot there. Pivot now has superior position. Pivot starts skating backwards or skating clockwise. Other blocker goes to initiate. She's right on the line. If she's off the line, it's barely. I can't really tell from this video very well. That wheel might be touching just a fraction beyond the line. It's hard to tell. She's making a pretty good effort at staying in bounds. It's hard to tell. You know, maybe my eyesight in person would have caught that. But either way, Jammer comes back in right and back. No call. So this is a this is a good no call. Let's take a look at the next one here. Oops. All right. Sorry about that. Here we go. All right. We have another potential cut. Now this time I'm going to do something here. I'm going to turn up sound here. Let's see if I can make this a little louder for you at home. And I don't know if I can. So let me see if I can turn this my system up louder. I want you to hear this. I don't know if this will help, but let's try this at home. Because what's going to happen is one of the skaters here. Oops, let's see. Here we go. The black pivot right there is going to be yelling, she went out, she went out, referring to the initiator. So, again, let's watch and see if the jammer cuts here. All right. 
what we've got is an interesting interesting call here. Here comes the jammer in. Jammer comes in. We've got some initiation going on. That, you know, we've obviously got a block for the rear ones trying to go in, but really it's the front blocker who's initiating the block that sends her out. I mean, the rear blocker may have made a little contact, but that wasn't what sent her out. It was the front blocker. So at this point, that jammer has superior position on the rear blue blocker, and it's the front blue blocker that sends her out. So the front blue blocker, again, that might be the pivot. I can, yep, it looks like there's a pivot stripe. So that, that pivot has superior position. The blocker does not. The blocker has gone out of bounds, so the blocker, had she been the issue, would have lost it anyway. But pivot stayed in. There we go. There goes that there goes that blocker down with two hands now, like this. But look what's happened now. That captain is yelling, she went out, she went out. But keep in mind, that's not the initiator, and we have different standards for the initiator and the non-initiator. So she's telling her, you know, she went out, she went out. So the jammer gets up. Jammer says, all righty, you're telling me to go back in. Jammer goes to go race back in, but in doing so, the pivot flinches. Pivot has gone, oh, crap, I don't know if I can, you know, I don't know if I, I uh, you know, I don't know if I actually have superior position or not. And the pivot like races forward to take, you know, get in front of her again. Looks like she might have entered just a hair ahead of her. But in the moment, you know, as you can see, that referee just gets in the way and it's hard to make that distinction. So the referee obviously didn't call it. But either way, that that pivot does have superior position. But for whatever reason, it was ruled didn't have superior position. Although it appears maybe she entered just a tiny bit ahead. But. And that pivot then basically raced in front. So a few things to keep in mind here. First off, skaters will sometimes, you know, like wave their arms in the air, you know, like trying to get the referee's attention and or trying to get the skater's attention saying, you know, just enter behind me or it's a cut, it's a cut, you know, whatever. Sometimes they're giving bad information. This pivot gave bad information. She's absolutely right. That blocker went out, but the blocker wasn't the problem. It was the pivot that was the problem. There we go. She went in. Now, I can't judge from that what that jammer can see, but from my perspective, with the way this referee just kind of woo gets in the way, and I just can't, I can't make a determination of whether she entered in front or not. So I no called this. And this, by the way, goes back to a point I made in one of the earlier lessons like that, is the right call is sometimes not the correct call. And that's a little bit uh, hard to kind of grasp here. The right call was no call. I wasn't sure. I didn't call it. But it looks like, in retrospect, maybe she entered just a tear ahead. Maybe it would have been correct to call the penalty, but it was not the right thing to do because I couldn't be certain of it. So the right call was no call, even if the, that it wasn't actually no call, you know, and the referee maybe should have grabbed it. Although the referee apparently judged that as being legal. So, again... And the jam continues like that. Never make a cutting call unless you're certain of it there. And remember that skaters will sometimes give you and each other bad information. Next. Oh, that's loud in my ear. This is much louder than the other program. All right, here we go. We got jam start. Black three, four, three, cutting. Okay, now something to keep in mind here. This was 2016. This is before the current cutting rules were in effect. In the current rules, you concede a cut. This was before that existed. So let's see what happens here. We've got that jammer goes right out of bounds. She's blocked out of bounds, it looks like, by that white blocker next to her with a purple helmet. She's out of bounds, and boom, she comes back in, not only ahead of the white blocker, but against one teammate, possibly others. I can't really see in there. Nope, doesn't look like it. Anyway, she clearly returned in ahead, and she went back out of bounds. You know, I'm guessing this is back out of bounds. We can't actually see. Under the old rule set, it was a penalty the instant she re-entered like this. That's the penalty right there. They don't have the opportunity to seed. Now they do. So this was a correct call at the time. You know, that they that, that she did actually cut the track. There she goes right in front of her. Black three, four, three, cutting. But assuming she went out of bounds when she came back, that would be a no call today because she seeded the cut. Uh, let's take a look at something else here. They, these things keep starting the instant I start them. Okay, here we go. Yeah. 
All right, what did, what happened here? Let's take one more look at it. Look at that black blocker. Oops, she has returned in bounds ahead of a non-initiator. Let's look. Here she is. She's going in. She's going out of bounds as a result of a missed block. It's not like somebody's forcing her out of bounds. So I wouldn't call any of the opposing. I would say there's no initiator that automatically gains superior position. But when she goes out of bounds, okay, we can't really tell if she's ahead or not of this kind of 122 there. And, I mean, she's clearly falling. Her knee hits about this time. But that doesn't matter. Look what happens. Look at 999, the pivot there. She will, She was ahead. And look what happens when she comes back in bounds. Boom. She enters, having gained superior position. Remember, maybe we can see if I called that as a cut in the moment, but certainly would be. And let's see if she sees. There we go. Yeah. She went back in bounds. She didn't seed. And apparently I didn't call it, so I must have missed it at the time. This is why I watch helmet cam footage. Because you may get done with the game, and you may say, Hey, you did great today, or I did okay, or whatever. But when you watch yourself on helmet cam footage or watch your performance, you catch things that you did not catch in the moments. Humble helmet cam footage is a very humbling way to watch Derby. I don't recommend referees do it on their first or second or third game, but if you've been doing this for a little while, you should absolutely be watching yourself on helmet cam foot or watching your helmet cam footage to see uh, you know, what you're missing. And by the way, I use, as long as I'm sitting right here, this is the helmet that I use. It's actually, let's see, I don't, can, can you see it at home? I know I'm kind of tiny in the corner here. The helmet cam is actually right here in the front where my finger is. It's built into the helmet itself. There's no giant camera. There's a mount, but the mount is actually a friend. Just put that on there. And, uh, but yeah, you can just tilt this kind of up and down. It has controls on the side. This is called the Bolt X3. I'm not even sure that they make them anymore, but you can still find some old ones on eBay and such like that. So... It's a great little helmet cam. Not the highest resolution footage, but you can't go... Uh, I, I think it's probably the safest helmet cam out there, just in terms of you're not, like, falling and hitting your head on, you know, like, on the side of a camera that isn't supposed to be there. And it's just nicely. It's just, like, right in the front of your helmet over there and just totally not obtrusive and not in the way. So I highly recommend watching your games in it. Let's take a look at another bit here. All right. Turn the sound down before I blast myself. Lead still open. All right, we got a jammer blocked to the outside. And the jammer returns in front of a skater there that had superior position. Let's watch this a little slowly here. There's the jammer. We can't exactly see what's going on back there. But she's getting blocked. It looks like there might be one or two initiators. Again, a little hard to... Maybe I can see a little better if I look at this. There she goes. We've got that rear of the two skaters there. That's blocking. And here we go. The rear one. But the front one is definitely getting in on this too. I'd say the front of those two blockers there. She's got the... Here we go. The... Or, him? Is this a co-ed game, I guess? I don't know. It's the skater in front there with a shiny black helmet. I said that's probably the initiator. And boom, there's the initiation that knocks the skater out of bounds. And the initiator ducks back, and the jammer comes right back in front. And that's going to be a cutting. And unless that initiator, um, unless the jammer immediately seeds the uh, seeds uh, seeds their superior position, there we go. Now we've got the cut. And that jammer is not seating. They're continuing to stride forward. So that warrant a cutting penalty. Again, ideally, you want someone from the outside to get this. And by the way, that begs the question, we have a rear OPR who skated right on and isn't staying. This is absolutely the priority action. That OPR should be locked in place watching this. Unless they're chasing down a penalty or have something better to do, I don't know what, you know, uh, could be really higher priority than staying back and watching this action. You know, like this. That's that's uh, not good coverage on the OPR's uh, part back there. Again, unless there's some overriding concern that's taking him up there. Because I would rather, I'd much rather been, as a jam rep, been watching for potential high block and let the OPR snag the cut. There are enough penalties to go around. We can share them, folks. So, you know, as a jam referee, I would have made the call, but I would also, off the jam, go up and say, hey, I need you 
tracking my jammers on the outside. I can't, you know, I shouldn't have to be making these calls. Or at least get the head referee to go say that. All right, let's take a look at our next bit of footage here. Ow, that is loud in my ear on this one. Okay. And she has to let her go. All right, cut or no cut? Watch it in slow motion. Here comes the jammer in. Jammer jumps. Jammer lands out of bounds. Jammer slides back in. Crawls back out. All right, this, and then they go down to 5% speed. I don't think we need to see it quite that slow. If we want to see where her foot lands, but here we can do it up here. Jammer's coming in. Jammer jumps. Jammer is jumping from inbounds, so she left legally, and she lands. Boom. She's she's now straddling the track as she lands, or at least has landed out of bounds. So I would call that an out of bounds landing. Jammer falls, or at least she's falling. See, she's going down. And in theory at this point, maybe she has somehow only touching the inside of the track and she's gone inbounds. But I suspect in the spur of the moment, it's just too fast for the human eye to really catch. And she's going down. See, uh, she went out of bounds anyway, so it doesn't matter. So she's reestablished an out of bounds position. And mind you, even if she came down here and you have to say, oh, well, she's she's now fully in bounds. She has to fully seed. It was a fraction of a second, probably almost too high, fast for the human eye to catch. And since she immediately went out, I probably would have just ignored that instant of being in bounds and just considered her landing to be like this. She slides back in. Since she's down, she has not reestablished a position on the track. So technically, she's not even cutting the track yet. You're not cutting the track until you stand up. That's when you establish a position on the track. Now, she knows if she stands up, and this being 2016 was under the last rule set, when if she stands, you get a cut, you don't have the opportunity, and you instantly get the penalty. So she's smart. She crawls off the track rather than stand up. So let's take a look at this at, at full speed, by the way. And you tell me if you could have caught that she had was like an instant, maybe entirely in bounds. Again, way too fast for the human eye to see. Maybe in, in real time, your eyes are has a res, res, higher resolution. Maybe you could have caught something. But yeah, I suspect most would just said no. She went down out of bounds. And I think that's a fine, fine way to assess that. So this would be no call. And uh, even in... You know, contemporary derby. Even if she'd landed, oops, upright and inbounds, even if she was upright, you know, and so she was cutting, and then say fell her seed, that would have been considered a seed, and that would have been sufficient. She immediately left, and we'll take it. All right, now we're gonna look at one more bit. There's some interesting stuff in this. Out of play! All right. Let's take a look at this here. I want you to tell me if there's a cut or no cut and one, one, on, on the part of the black jammer. Out of play! It was called as no call at the time. Let's take a look. Here comes black jammer. Black jammer is whizzing up the outside. The green blocker initiates now she's clearly you see green blocker is like right in the middle of the track now so green blocker is clearly coming in there to initiate green blocker initiates she's off balance and she's way off balance trying to keep up and it's not working and she goes down two hands down steps out comes back in the out of play calls up about the time she's coming back in so, no, there's no real evidence of a cut here, and indeed it is not. It is no call. But I'm showing you this clip because there's some interesting stuff. First, remember that the that we do not assess fully assess the impact of a block until, until the skater uh, or the target has regained control of their actions. So in this case, for example, black, you know, even though right now she has passed green blocker, that block is still continuing. We can't tell. Like, let's say Green Arm had forearmed her to get her into this position. Well, we're not done yet. You wouldn't say, well, that's legal because she clearly got past her because we're not done with the aftermath yet. She's going off balance. She has not regained control of her actions. And 
boom, she goes down. So had that been a forearm on the part of Green Arm, or, or I'm sorry, Green Blocker, then I certainly would have issued a penalty at this point because the aftermath was it forced her down. But that block appears to be legal. So, okay, the skater basically goes around and comes down. Second, two hands out of bounds. That's that's considered out of bounds. Right now, at this moment, this particular frame here, she only has one hand down. The other one's about like two inches above the ground. She is not out of bounds at this point. Now, tenth of a second later, she's out of bounds. But at the moment, that skater is upright and in bounds as much as it may not look it. Had she been able to salvage it, had she raised up that hand and stabilized herself, then she would have stayed in bounds and she would have stayed upright. That's that funny exception we use in the rule, and it will lead to some awkward moments like that where you're like, wow, that looked really ugly, but that skater didn't touch with that second hand or arm, so we'll take it. Next, something to keep in mind here is that look, what she, look at the block between green blocker and black jammer. She's going around, but I'm not even sure that green blocker is really even touching her. I mean, she's trying to, but look at look at the the space between the front of black blocker and uh, I'm sorry, the black jammer and green blocker. It looks like she's going in for the hit, but it's actually black jammer who's swerving. You know, it's like her swerve to avoid that hit that took her down and out of bounds. So in this particular case, remember that a skater is not allowed to exit the track to avoid a block. But that's not actually what happened. You know, she made a good faith effort to stay inside. It was actually pretty good. She almost made it like that. And so I'm not going to give her a penalty. I'm not going to she didn't actually skate out of bounds to avoid the block. Even though she's out of bounds, she went out of bounds as a result of the action. But really, she made a she made a very good effort to stay in bounds. She tried very hard to be legal. She just couldn't quite do it. You know. So does she, is this even considered like once she, suppose she lifted her hands right now and she stood back up is that a cut or is that not a cut on green blocker considering oops excuse me considering the fact that green blocker did not even physically put her in that position it was her own action that took her there so if she stood up now would she be cutting the answer is yes here's why it does not have to be a physical block. The fact that green blocker is not the one, like, there may have even been no physical contact between her, but it would still be a cut. Because black blocker, I'm sorry, green blocker is making a positional block. She's moving into her way, and she's forcing black blocker to kind of react to her. And black blocker tried to stay in and wasn't able to. So that block from green blocker had significant effect even though it was only positional, it didn't manage to actually physically force her to this position. It was Black Blocker's own doing that wound up her getting there. But we're still going to consider that to be, yeah, she's got to enter behind her. That was a block on the part of uh, Green Blocker that got her out of bounds. You know, it didn't even really make much of the way physical contact, but it doesn't matter. It was enough to get her in that position. Think of it this way. Suppose they were on the apex and Black Jammer came up right now and jumped and she's in the air, and she's in the air, and she gets past, and then she doesn't make her landing, and she falls like this. It's the same sort of thing. Like in an apex jump, oftentimes the line is wall is sitting there, but they're not always. Sometimes the, the edge blocker tries to, you know, lay into the, the jammer as they go by. But it's the same thing. Often, even if there's not physical contact, it was a positional block that forced the apex jump. So in this particular case, it was a physical block, not an apex jump. But it's the same concept. I'm sorry, it was it was a it was a positional block, not a physical. Forced her in this position. So I'm gonna say green blocker has superior position. Now, she steps out of bounds, so she's seated even had she cut, she has now seated it. She did it at the first legal opportunity. It only took her about a step or two to get out of bounds. That's fine. So any obligation she had to seat is fine. She's no longer cutting. She just has to enter behind green blocker, because green blocker has superior position. She's coming in. And remember what happened at the end, by the way. Let's see, I can put this on full speed. Here we go. Out of play! I yelled out of play. Green blocker went out of play. So she gets to the end, and she has gone out of play. If I recall correctly, yeah, it's because look at look at green blocker here. And there's more than, you know, like that jammer member is not in the pack. And my peripheral vision is slightly greater than what these cameras will get on, uh, what this camera will catch. So the next blocker up there, see the one that's uh, on the red line right now? 
she had gotten just too far ahead. So I called an out of play, and maybe that was maybe I wasn't even quite accurate. I don't know. But either way, I called as an out of play in the moment. Let's just because I can't get a very good view. Let's just assume I'm correct. So out of play, and she re-enters. You know. So remember, in the instant it takes me to yell out of play, I'm not yelling out of play till I see it. So there's a fraction of a second of a delay, like a quarter second, half a second, something in there. So, and I'm not yelling it until I know that green blocker has gone out of play. So green blocker, first off, by being the initiator of a block, she has to, she has that perk, remember, that she gains that superior position, even though, even if she was behind, uh, uh, you know, black blocker when she went out of bounds. And so black blocker, uh, I'm sorry, so green blocker has an obligation to stay in play to maintain that superior position. So as soon as I yelled out of play, or as soon as I saw she went out of play, I should say, then green blocker has lost her superior position. So even if black blocker just blatantly, I'm sorry, black jammer blatantly entered in front of green blocker, the fact that she went out of play would mean she she didn't have to enter in front of her any, I'm in back of her anymore. She can enter in front, and it's just simply no earned pass at that point. But... Uh, yeah, I appear to be, uh, I think I'm Jammer F in this one. Maybe I was rear IPR, but, oops, yeah, I think, yeah, since I'm pointing, clearly, I must be, uh, I must be, uh, uh, wait a second, no, but I yelled out of play, so I don't know, I guess, I guess, I don't know what I am. Anyway, point being, is that black blocker, boop, like that, when I yelled out of play, she appears to be coming back in, in back of her anyway. Certainly, we can't make much of a distinction from this angle. The jammer referee should be right there. I think the jammer actually had overshot it and missed her going back. I think that was the issue. Anyway, either way, out of play warning goes up. Game continues on. Yeah, I think that's the jammer ref. So, you know, either way, you know, no penalty. I'm good with that. So, and there was a lot of interesting stuff in that clip, but... Still, still no call. And I want you to, wanted you to get familiar with some of those concepts. So, you know, it's funny. Cutting is an extremely common penalty. And yet I was able to find a surprisingly small amount of footage of it. So I've made a note to myself to watch for more footage on this in the future. And uh, in a year or so, or whenever the next rule set comes out, I have to update this lesson. If, if I have to update this lesson, I will come back to it. And I will uh, by then have some more footage to add to this over here and show you some more interesting cutting 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 actions over there otherwise thanks for tuning in that concludes lesson 22a which was uh, what was that game structure penalties part two part one which i by the way have just renamed for simplicity cutting the track so i kind of renamed it in the middle of things so you may notice my sheets have slightly different names now than some of these lessons are saying so uh, so sorry for any confusion from that We'll be back in Lesson 22B, which I have renamed as Altering the Flow of the Game, but I think I'm still saying on some of the video, still calling it Game Structure Penalties Part 2, Part 2. So, anyway, see you next video.